So we are continuing our time together uh, in the Gospel of Mark. So let's read. This is Mark 16, starting with verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been already rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed, for you are looking, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I'm not sure about you, but uh, this past eight months or so, nine months or whatever the months are these days, uh, it's been, it's felt like a, a season of hard news and challenging news and bad news. And um, if you're like me, it's time for some good news. (laughs) I could use some good news. Could you use some good news? Um, And no matter what happens with the election, no matter what happened with the election, I'm sure uh, there's disappointment on on all kinds of different sides. And so I think we collectively, uh, as a a global community, could use some good news um, because COVID is still here. So my hope is this morning we can celebrate some good news together. And it starts with this. Starting again in, in verse 1, the Sabbath was over. And Mary Magdalene and the Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. Him, of course, being Jesus. The context here, Jesus was crucified. He was laid in the tomb. The Sabbath was over. So, so let's, let's just do the math. He was crucified on Friday. Saturday is the Sabbath. Here it's saying the Sabbath is over. So then, so here we have Sunday morning. Uh, and they, Mary Magdalene and Mary, uh, so two Marys, are going to anoint Jesus. They're going through the, the sort of ceremonial process of tending to the corpse of Jesus. So they arrived, the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they've been saying to another, they, they were concerned, uh, who will roll away the stone from a, for us for the entrance to the tomb. And then there's this, re- there's this really interesting um, text. It says, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, was, which was very large, had already been rolled back. This term there, looked up, is, um, there's, there's a Greek root there, kind of, it's called anablepo, anablepo, right? And uh, it's appeared at least four other times throughout the Gospel of Mark. Uh, well, for other instances, it's, it's, it, there's, I think, maybe six altogether times where Anablepo, the, the root there is presented. The first two, or one is, the first one is in Mark 6. Uh, Jesus looks up to heaven before breaking the bread and feeding the 5,000. The second is in Mark 7. Jesus looks up to heaven and he heals the blind man. So there's two instances, first, of Jesus looking up to heaven. Uh, The second two instances, we have Mark 8, a blind man looks up and he sees vaguely, he sees people walking around like trees, you remember that? Uh, And then Jesus lays hands on him again and his sight is fully restored. And then in Mark 10 again, uh, a blind man says, teacher, let me see again. And and then uh, it says that his sight is regained as Jesus heals him. So there's six, six instances, four different kind of settings where this root on a blepo is used. Uh, and then here in Mark 16, when Mary and Mary look up, that word anablepo is used again. And the first two instances uh, in Mark, it's Jesus looking up to heaven. And in the second two instances, it's these blind men receiving their sight. Eugene Boring says that w- when you really sit with the, the, the usage of anablepo here and you look at the, the way that it's used and, and, and the tense that it's used in and, and, and the sort of a, a good translation could, could argue it's perhaps a, a better English way 
to, to fit within this narrative here is, is this, you know, when they looked up. But the, the way that Mark is using this root on Ablepo is there's this reference to the earlier moments in Mark's gospel, both when Jesus would look up to heaven and also when blind men would receive sight. And so perhaps another translation could, could, could be argued that uh, it's not just when they looked up, but when their sight was restored, right? They saw that the stone was very large, had already been rolled back. And so there's this, this moment in Mark 16, 4, where Mary and Mary regain their sight. Their sight is restored. And so there's this sort of coming together of, of this Jesus looking up to heaven, blind man receiving sight, and this combination of looking up to heaven, receiving sight once again, and these women look up and their sight is restored. And whereas before the cross... Before the crucifixion, disciples and, and people that had, had so much hope in Jesus had abandoned him. They'd left him. Some had betrayed him. Peter denied him. And then everyone together got together and they, the whole cohort, cohort uh, agreed to his crucifixion. Now these women come to, uh, to anoint his body. They, they come, to, um, they come to, to not anoint, they come to like care for his um, uh, yeah his corpse and and then all of a sudden they look up and their sight is restored and they see and they realize something was different and i think it fits with the mark in narrative here that it was god who restored their sight just as uh, jesus was the one healing the blind men and so by by grace uh their sight is restored uh, and I, I, I believe that Mark's gospel at this moment, right, uh, it, it, it's, it's this like powerful moment when, when, you know, those whose hopes in Jesus had vanished on the cross, when they realized he wasn't who they thought he was going to be, when they came to his tomb in grief and mourning to tend to his corpse, they looked up and their sight was restored. They had come to, and, and what's interesting here is, right, they come in and, and they're focused on the stone. They're coming to the, the tomb to anoint him with, with oil and, and, and spices and, and to tend to his, to his body. And, and, and they're focused ahead. They're focused ahead on, all right, well, the logistics, right? Who's going to roll away the big stone for us? And life was continuing the way it always had. And they were looking ahead at what had to be done. And, and that makes sense. And, they, and, and they were, they're focused on the task at hand. But I think the text points us towards something powerful here. And that's this idea that they were looking ahead when they needed to be looking up. They were looking ahead when they needed to be looking up. And so for me, as I was sitting with this and reading this, I was convicted with this this reality that I I think many of us, myself definitely included, uh, have become blind to the movements of God by keeping our eyes fixed on everything around us, by keeping our eyes fixed on what's ahead, fixed on the task at hand, fixed on on all the things that that need to get done, Uh, and and life is normal, God isn't doing something new and powerful, and God isn't continuing to resurrect this world, and I just got to keep, you know, and, and, and instead, I think there's this invitation to look up and recover our sight. Again, this is me. Uh, this is me. This is I am so just focused on the day to day. Keep the you know focus on what has to get done. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking ahead. And so often I fail to take a moment to stop and look up and say, God, are you doing something new here? Maybe you're like me. I so easily get sucked into this lie that. The hope of my salvation, right, is somehow provided by someone or something other than Jesus. Is this you as well? Perhaps it's for you, you know, it's like, all right, well, this new job, this new house, maybe, you know, this this new hobby, this new relationship, this new whatever it is, this is going to be the the sort of pathway of my salvation. Um, uh, You know, what I see all the time is, you know, what's like the big trend now, right? It's like, 
all right, you, you know, leave your job or maybe just your job is now remote. So like buy a van and live by the beach somewhere. And you know, like that's, that's your pathway to salvation. And I can't, it's, it's kind of hard to argue with that one. But, um, you know, and not to like dismiss that stuff. I mean, that's a cool thing. Like, man, if you can do that, pull it off. But, but at the same time, there's this recognition that we just get so focused on just the things ahead, ahead. And, and, and we don't stop to say, God, like, is there something bigger here that I don't even understand that you're doing? A lot of us right now, I mean, these days, it's like, all right, well, it's this new candidate. Or maybe this new ministry is going to like, uh, you know, will fit COVID times and then we'll, this new program or, you know, I mean, for you, if you're like me, um, th- this is the, the one that really sort of stood out to me as I was convicted of this tendency of mine to just look ahead, look ahead instead of looking up. How many times did you check the election results this week? If you were like me, I was like borderline neurotic at times where I realized I was checking, like, you know, I'm checking over and over and over and over. And I'm looking, I'm like, Nevada, like, seriously, like 75, we can't, you know, the percentage hasn't changed at all. You just count numbers, you, you know, and I'm getting frustrated because I'm like, get them, figure it out, figure it out. And then I just realized, I'm like, man, I'm just looking ahead. I'm looking ahead. Let's look up. Let's look up. My salvation, my, my hopes and dreams flourishing, the, the, my identity isn't caught up in who wins this election. And, and I don't mean that, that we're meant to disengage. That's not what I'm saying. But there were times that I myself drifted from this desire to be a well-informed participant in this country to, to looking for a hope ahead of me when I should have been looking up. So the first reflection I have for us this morning, don't let looking ahead stop you from looking up. The reality is I, I think we need both, right? Um, the stone was rolled away. Uh, the, the task at hand was taken care of. Uh, but looking up, they received their sight again. And they were able to see the new thing that God was doing. And so as we find ourselves in a challenging situation, may we be reminded of the the, the famous words that we find in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's run the race laid out in front of us. Fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. May we fix our eyes on Jesus during these challenging times. So, Again, that's not an abandonment of looking ahead. We need engagement. We especially need engagement as those advocating on behalf of, of the marginalized in our world. This, the, looking ahead doesn't stop you from, uh, from ever looking up. We, we need to find that balance of both. But, but for me, it's, it's, it was this reminder that, that looking up is something that I need to, to start doing a little bit better job of. So that's good news, number one. Number two. Starting in verse 5, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. So what he says is he's been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So there's a young man there. Uh, The way he's described, most would assume that Mark's gospel is claiming that this man is an angel. He's sitting on the right side, so uh, occupying a position of authority, a position of solidarity with Jesus. And what does he say about Jesus? What does he say in this pivotal moment, right? In in many ways, this could be the the one of the 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 pivotal moments in, in the entire gospel of Mark. They enter the tomb. Jesus is not there. This angel says he's not here. He's going ahead of you. And there you'll see him. And some, to summarize it, he says, he has been raised. He is not here. He's going ahead of you. You will see him. And these women are presented with the universe-shaking good news of Christ's resurrection. 
so the second uh, good news here is, is simply an invitation to hear the good news of Jesus. In a season when we need good news, here is good news. He has been raised. He is not here. He is going ahead of you. You will see him. Hear that good news this morning. If you haven't heard that good news, hear it now. Hear it now. He's been raised. He's not here. He's going ahead of you. You'll see him. That's the good news of Jesus' resurrection. If we're going to bring it within the broader message of Mark's gospel, Jesus is God's son. His kingdom is here, it's now, and forever. He established His kingdom in a way no one expected by dying on a cross and rising three days later, and we are invited to participate in its movement in this world by responding to this good news with our lives by following the risen Jesus. He has been raised. He is not here. He is going ahead of you. You will see Him. That is the greatest news in history. It validates everything Jesus said and did. It shows that death itself cannot hold our king. Uh, A wonderful piece of good news in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, It invites us to participate in this movement, this community, this kingdom that's bigger than er any tribe, any tongue, any nation. As, As we are a people released from the grips of death, we're sent out into the world to proclaim this truth. Uh, with grace as we are ambassadors of God's love. That is the good news of Jesus. And this news changes everything. He's been raised. He's not here. He's going ahead of you. My timer's going off. And you will see him. To look up and see the empty tomb means to go from blindness to sight. To see the empty tomb is to see that Christ's mission is to fulfill the law, to reverse the failure of Adam and rule the earth as the human one on God's behalf, to invade a dying world and redeem. It is, it, it's all happening. This abandonment of the tomb means it, it, just, it comes at everything that Jesus did. He's not here. Where is he? He's going ahead of you. You'll see him on your mission. The good news, again, of Jesus is simply what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. So hear the good news of Jesus. And third, I think what we can see from this text is an invitation to share the good news of Jesus. Hear the good news of Jesus and and share the good news of Jesus. If If we look at the text, their sight is restored when they hear the good news of Jesus. Their sight is restored, and then they hear the good news of Jesus. Remember, God is the one who, by His grace, is the one restoring sight. They look up, and their sight's restored. I believe that God is is the one that, that, through His grace, restores their sight. And then accompanying this restored sight is a declaration of this good news of Christ's resurrection. The angel's sitting there. He's been raised. He's not here. He's going ahead of you. You will see Him. In this season of COVID, when we're surrounded by death, He has been raised. Death does not have the final answer. This cavern of death of the tomb could not hold him. He's going ahead of us. We will see him. In a world marked with injustice, injustice does not have the final answer. Jesus has been raised. He's not here. He's going ahead of us. We will see him. The good news of this resurrection is spread first by God opening our eyes of God's grace. By the way, that's why we participate in the, the, the sacramental sacramental practices that we do, the, the sacrament of communion, the sacrament of baptism. We believe that God's grace is poured out in those moments. And so God's, God opens and restores their sight with His grace. And then in collaboration, There's someone declaring what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do. So remember one thing um, in in sharing the good news. Um, And and I want you to consider another. When you think about sharing the good news, I want you to remember one thing and consider another. Remember one thing. Remember this. Who in your life partnered with God in helping you see by sharing the good news of Jesus with you? Is there someone in your life who partnered with God's grace in helping opening, open your eyes? Um, is there someone who partnered with God when God opened your eyes with, with God's grace? Is there someone who partnered with God in, in, in sharing the good news of Jesus? If there is, take a moment to reflect on who that was. 
Just be grateful for them. Who was it that partnered with God, who opened your eyes and, and shared this good news? How has, that, how has that changed your whole life? So remember that. Remember that thing. And then consider one more thing. How may God be encouraging you to declare what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do? How might God encourage you to declare what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do in your own life and in this world we're a part of? If you think of who told you and who told them and who told them and who told them, you realize that there's this continuation of this, this beautiful story of what Christ has done, is doing, and will do. And there's this story that, that is spread, that is shared and passed on and passed on and passed on. And, and I am a recipient of it and, and you might be a recipient of it. And if you really stop and think about this, if you really want to think about the, the origin of that story, the way that um, if you trace it all back to think of who told you and, and who it was that told that person, who told that person, and, and who told that person, and you go back across the centuries, and, and then you, you stop and you realize um, that according to Mark's gospel, if you trace it back to the moment when the good news of Jesus was pr first proclaimed from the empty tomb, uh, according to Mark's gospel, you can thank two women named Mary. That's right, you can thank two women named Mary. See, their moment of ceremonial lament that was filled with grief, it was filled with mourning, it was immediately transformed when their sight was restored and they heard the greatest news in history and they shared that. And they shared that with someone and set forth uh, a, a pattern, set forth uh, this, this movement of sharing the greatest news in the history of the world with others. And we are the recipients of that good news. So I think we can take a moment to celebrate these women and thank them. And you might be saying, wait a second, because in verse 8 it says, they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's fair. Let's sit with that for a second, though. Um, I, I think some would argue it probably references a short time of fear and silence, followed by sharing the good news. Uh, it's one of those, you know, there is a there is a shipwreck and no survivors, and and there's intimate details of everything that happened. It's like, well, how, if there are no survivors, and how did we hear the story? You know, <laughs> right? There, so this this acknowledgement that that. Again, Mark is writing his gospel in a way that is, that is challenging the reader, that's inviting the reader into this um, experiential uh, type of reading. And so I think there's this acknowledgement that, yeah, perhaps they, they, there was this moment of fear and silence, and then, of course, they, were, they would share with Peter and the other apostles. And, of course, there's also alternate endings to Mark's gospel that were added later that do declare that these women went out and shared. And I think it's reasonable to acknowledge that that they were the beginnings of this story as proclaimed in Mark's gospel, and that the, 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 they were the first to go and, and share this good news. And it's important to acknowledge, you know, as Mark is writing this gospel in a way that's inviting the reader to this sort of experiential reading, we as the reader, we've been the people in this story all along. Mark is presenting us with, us the readers, with a choice, right? A choice to make. Will we go forth and proclaim this good news of Jesus or not? I think the original Mark probably ended at verse 8, and it was this, this sort of like abrupt ending where from the beginning you know who Jesus is, and, and there's this doubt, this mystery, this, this sort of way in which he brings his ministry to, to the Jewish people, and it encounters the Romans, and, and then everything is, is going a totally different direction than you thought it might, and then at the end you realize he is who he said he is. He, he is the Son of God. He was raised from the dead, and then... It's terrifying news. And those who hear it for the first time are terrified and they can't share it. And there's this sort of literary challenge. Will you be the one to share the good news of Jesus? The reader is invited to sit with the story and challenged to be persuaded by its truth and to share it with others. I think when we sit with verse 8, we see something else too. This idea that they went out and fled from the tomb and, and terror and amazement seized them. 
terror and amazement sees them and, and, and they were afraid. And that's the reality that the good news is not without fear and trembling. It's not. Jesus has gone ahead of us, but, but where was that? He went to the cross and was then resurrected. And, and, and we're called to follow in that process, to die to ourselves in order to bring life to others. Jesus says that, right? He says, those who want to follow me are called to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And we have to move forward uh, to, to fight of course, like the sin in our own lives and, and, this, and the sin in this world. There's this interesting, again, getting back to the, like a literal translation in, in this when it says, you're, you're seeking Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. A literal reading of that in the original language is this, Jesus, you are seeking, seeking the Nazarene, the crucified one. And there's this, this, this claim that crucified one is, is now a title that, that honors and celebrates what Jesus has done on the cross. And, and the tense that's used there is, is a tense that, that um, uh, it's hard to, to sort of like unpack it in English, but it, it's a tense that, that uh, in the Greek, that what they refuse to use this tense that relegates the crucifixion to a one-time historical act. But it's, it's almost like the Nazarene, the, the crucifying one, or the one who is continuously crucified, this sort of active movement that is in the past, but it's, it's, it's not just in the past. It's this active continuation that, that continues to this day. This idea that, that the crucifixion is not simply a one-time cosmic moment, although it certainly is a powerful moment that is unique in its sign, but it's, it's also this acknowledgement that the crucified one is, is now the one that we follow. And this, this invitation toward crucifixion, the invitation toward the cross, to bear our cross, continues. And so, yes, terror and amazement and fear may accompany the good news. This crucifixion of Jesus is now a central component of his identity as the Messiah. He has been raised. He is not here. He is going ahead of you. You will see him. Where did he go? To the cross, the tomb. And then, out of the tomb, into the world. This good news of Jesus and his kingdom, it means that we are invited out into a whole new identity. We're called out of our former identity. We're born again. We're called toward the cross. We're commanded not to conform to the patterns of this world. And we're compelled to challenge the effects of sin, personal sin and global sin. And that Jesus invites us into that journey with him. That's what Jesus has done. That's what Jesus is doing. And that's what Jesus will do. And then we're called forth. We're called to follow Jesus on his mission to offer himself to bring others life. It's a challenging good news, but it is a good news because that ultimately is where we find our true calling, our true humanity, our true life. So in a season uh, where we all need some good news, <laughs> don't let looking ahead stop you from looking up. We have to stay engaged with our world. We don't abandon and dismiss the challenges and, and brokenness and injustices of this world. We, we fight and, and in the name of Jesus bring forth love with grace and truth. And, and we do that. We, we take care of the things that have to be taken care of. But do not let looking ahead stop you from looking up because Jesus might be doing something entirely new. And if you don't take moments to look up and see it, they'll pass you by and you may miss the resurrection. Second, hear the good news of Jesus. Hear the good news of Jesus, that, that Jesus has risen from the, the, the tomb. He has been raised. He is not here. He is going ahead of you. You will see him. Hear that good news, receive that good news, be transformed by that good news. And then share that good news. Isn't it good news? Do you know, I mean, do you know that's the root of the word evangelical? Evangelical means a, a bearer of good news. 
to evangelize, to, to, to sh- that's what it means. It comes from this Greek of, of good news, of, of sharing good news. And what better news is there? Jesus has risen from the dead. All the things he said are legit. And he, his kingdom is here and it's now. And his kingdom is here and it's now. And, and wherever God's will is done, is, is his kingdom is there. And, and it, it's, it's about bringing about love and, and, and flourishing and justice and beauty and, and re- renewal and restoration and redemption and salvation. And someday that will all be made complete and total. It's like the best news ever. Can we please recover the, the identity that we're called into to be bearers of good news, to share good news? So share the good news of Jesus and follow Jesus on his mission to offer himself to bring others life. Don't let looking ahead stop you from looking up. Hear the good news of Jesus. Share the good news of Jesus and follow Jesus on his mission to offer himself to bring others life. So here again, this good news. He has been raised. He is not here. He is going ahead of you. You will see him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we look up and have our sight restored. May we hear the good news of Jesus. May we share the good news of Jesus. May we follow Jesus on his mission to offer himself to bring others life. And may we find new life in the resurrected Christ today and in the days to come. May it be so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.